Good morning, Cornerstone. Uh, I'm Elder Mike. Uh, each of you, if I can say this, is precious to God. I had a chance to share um, what I'm going to share with you right now, um, just as a little heart-to-heart -heart with uh, our brothers and sisters at Cornerstone Tokyo, and uh, really just on my heart as an elder, I just want to express to you, uh, as, as part of the elder team, uh, each of you is precious not only to God, but you're precious to me, you're precious to each of us on the elder team, to the pastoral staff. Uh, we care about you. And uh, our heart is to spend our lives for you, even as Jesus has come and spent his life for all of us, that as the ones who give uh, spiritual covering, as the ones who are here for your spiritual good, for your growth, we are here to spend our lives for you. And so part of the reason I'm saying this right now is because I know that probably in this room right now, there's uh, things that each of us probably brings in that we may be struggling with, that we may be wrestling with, that we may be really uh, beset by in our life, Con really just controlling our emotions, controlling how we're living. And, uh, and those are things that God wants us to be able to uh, move beyond and uh, so uh, what I'm going to share next is really a preface to the message, and that is that um, our heart is to spend ourselves for you so that you go deeper with Jesus, because as you go deeper with Jesus, uh, we believe and we have experienced ourselves that you're going to have deeper peace and deeper joy and deeper life and deeper love, such that even if your circumstances remain difficult, and hard that you will in your heart be okay and so part of that is as we go through this message and as we go through the rest of the messages in this series is really I want to implore you uh, if you take nothing away from this message except for this it would be enough is to really move beyond just hearing what will be said but really actively listen is there something in our heart that needs to shift? Is there something in the way we're living or the way we're thinking or the way we're doing things that needs to shift today? If you just listen to the message and you leave, probably within an hour, you're gonna forget a big chunk of it. And I think research shows that we will forget things even within an hour. Within a week, you're probably gonna for have forgotten about 80% of what you've heard. And so today, Jesus wants us to have life. Today, Jesus wants us to walk into deeper life. But that requires that we not just hear, but we really search and say, God, what do you want to shift for me today? Because he wants to lead us on the road of life. But if we're not going to actively apply what we are listening to, it's going to be hard to take that journey. Uh, many of you know my wife, Patty. You know she's super practical. You know that she uh, is really has a good way of knowing how to do things. When I listen to my wife, um, I hope I get some loving later. When I listen to my wife, I'll, usually things turn out pretty good. We usually eat well. Uh, her way of suggesting to do things when I follow and do, those, do, do it her way, usually things go pretty fast and things go pretty efficient. Um, but my wife is not God, okay? God, as smart as my wife is, God is a lot smarter. God's been around a lot longer. God has a lot more wisdom than my wife. And so as much as listening to my wife uh, leads to good things, how much more when we listen to the one who loves us and is going to try to lead us on the path of goodness? who's been around, who's seen it all, who wants us to go to a place of life. And so when we let God lead, it's usually going to lead to a lot of good things. It's going to lead to life in us. It's going to lead to life around us. But if we just go our own way, again, we're going to be on a path of death. And so today, again, today, as you listen, throughout this week, as you read what God says in his word, next week, at the next message, what are the things that God wants you to apply today? Because if you apply it today, 
you're going to be on the road of life. If you don't apply it today, it's just going to get forgotten, and it's not going to lead to anything. Okay? So again, as the elder team, as a pastoral team, as the ones who are here for your good, just want to encourage you, let's actively listen today and actively listen with the Holy Spirit and see what he wants for us today. Okay? Let's go ahead and get into today's message and um, see what God has to say. Father God, even as uh, Elder Duane uh, felt led to just lead us into that time, that's beautiful. And so even today in the posture of our hearts, we ask for more. We ask for more of your heart. We ask for more of your wisdom. We ask for more of your guidance. We ask for more of your goodness. Uh, many of us today, we are struggling with things, wrestling with things, beset by things, hurt by things, um, and we need more. And so we pray today, Jesus, as you died, as you rose again, as you came to give us life, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take that work and that you would minister that to us today, that our hearts would be filled with more life, that our thoughts would be filled with more life, that our families would be filled with more life, that our world would be filled with more life because you love it when there's more life. And so we pray for that eternal life, that knowing of you, God, that you came to give us. Apply it today in very practical and real ways. For it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. We've been in a series in 2 Corinthians, and today's message is all of God for all of me. All of God for all of me. Uh, after I sent the uh, title out to Pastor Anton. He's like, oh, did you see the song set and all that kind of stuff? I was like, God, oh, no. But God just has his way. And so really, what does it mean that God gives all of himself to us? And what does it mean that we give all of ourself to him? I want you to think, first of all, in terms of when you love someone. Maybe some of us are starting to date someone or we... Uh, really want to be going out with this particular person, and maybe someone's asked you out. Um, when you love someone or when you like someone a lot, uh, you are willing to do a lot, right? Uh, not only uh, are you willing to sacrifice a lot, right? You're willing to open up your schedule. You're willing to say no to other things so that you can be with this person. Uh, you're willing to kind of give up a lot, not only as a, as a person who's kind of interested in another person, but as a parent, you know that for children, we love our kids, we're willing to do so much for our kids, we're willing to sacrifice so much for our kids, for spouses, we're willing to sacrifice so much for our spouses, and as our relationship matures, as even we go through difficulties in life and even difficulties in our own relationship, but God uses that to mature us, we find that love takes on a different nature, a different character, but still at its very core is I care for this person, I love this person, and I'm willing to sacrifice a lot for that person. Um, we are willing to do a lot for someone. If you think of someone you really like, someone you really love, I think you also realize that, man, I'm willing to do so much for their good. I'm willing to give of myself so much. Not only are you willing to sacrifice a lot, do a lot, but you are willing to probably go far. You are willing to kind of go the extra mile, the extra two miles. You're willing to go, keep going, right? Even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, you're going to keep going because we just naturally love and we naturally just want the best for this person. We want to be with this person. And so we are willing to go far for this person and keep going far. We are willing to even endure a lot, right? Sometimes love hurts. Oftentimes love hurts. Oftentimes love costs us. And we all inherently understand that in our own human relationships with those we really love, right? If I can say this another way, when we love someone, we are willing to suffer a lot. When I spoke uh, last month, uh, we talked a lot about suffering. We talked about some of the reasons we go through suffering. And even as Christians, why God allows us to go through suffering. 
And even last week's message, Pastor Joe was talking about different things of cost and suffering. And so uh, the Christian life is not one that is meant to be free of suffering. God, sometimes we have expectations of God that if I love God, if God loves me, then I'm not going to suffer. But if you look throughout scripture, suffering is everywhere. And sometimes those who love God most suffer the most. And of course, Jesus suffers the most because he loves us. And so on some level, we understand that, okay, our relationship with others, when we love them, we are willing to suffer. We are willing to go far. We are willing to endure a lot. But it also goes in our relationship with God. Before I get to that part, again, in terms of suffering a lot, what's very natural for us was very natural for Jacob. Genesis 29, 20, Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. He actually served another seven years for, because his uncle tricked him, but he served seven years plus seven years for Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. So again, I think on some level, we can all relate to that. When we love someone, we're willing to spend our life for someone. We're willing to actually suffer and endure a lot for someone. God does that for us. And he gives us all of himself, suffering so much for us. And as we are filled with more and more of God's love, we are willing to spend ourselves for him. It's natural for us to spend ourselves for others, especially those that we really care about in our family. But sometimes uh, there's a disconnect in terms of, oh, well, why would I have to suffer for God? Why would I have to spend myself for God? God's supposed to spend himself for me, which he does. This is not about performance. This is not about trying to earn anything from God. But it's very natural in a love relationship that we're going to spend ourselves for others. Hopefully they spend themselves for us. That's how the relationship goes deeper. But if God is always spending himself for us, and the expectation is, God, you're going to spend yourself for me, and God, you're not going to let me suffer, and God, you're going to make my life great, and God, I don't have to do anything really for you, or I just come to service on Sunday, I just sing some songs, I go to church, I'm a good Christian, but there's no cost. That doesn't make sense even from our own human understanding of what love is in our own human relationships. It's very natural when we love that we're going to spend. And so God spends himself for us. And God, I guess, I guess God's hope is that we would spend ourselves for him. That it's okay for ourselves, for us to spend ourselves for him. That he's worth us spending for. Like if I'm not willing to spend for my wife, financially, time-wise, myself, she would very legitimately question, how much do you care about me? How much do you love me? If I'm always asking her to spend herself for me, again, how much do you really care about me? And so in the same way, how come sometimes in our mind with God, it's just this weird disconnect that I don't have to spend myself for God and that suffering is something that I should be immune from or uh, you know, uh, exempt from? Because when we love, we're going to spend. It's natural. So as we're filled with more and more of God's love, we are willing to, and we can, suffer a lot for others, even those who are hard to love. You know, I think if I asked us all to raise our hand, we would all say that in our life, we have probably come across people who are hard to love. People who actually not just don't care about us, but are actually out to hurt us. And it is hard, and it's very natural in our humanness to want to just say, yeah, I'm done, forget this. But as we are filled with more and more of God's love, we can actually spend ourselves on behalf of others. When Jesus says, love God, love others, if we're not able to uh, really suffer, it's going to be hard to love others because people are hard to love. So let's get into the passage today. All of that is a preface for kind of what we're talking about today. 2 Corinthians 6.3, Paul loves the Corinthians. Paul is willing to spend himself, on, spend himself on behalf of the Corinthians and on behalf of so many others. And so what is, you know, what's happened is uh, people have come in with letters of recommendation. They've tried to lead the Corinthians astray. 
Paul's coming in and uh, the, the Corinthians are saying, well, who are you, Paul? You don't have letters of recommendation. Who are you? Uh, there's been distance that's been put in. There's been a break in, uh, kind of a distance put in this relationship, a break that's kind of entering into this relationship between Paul and these people that he really loves. And so he is forced, in a sense, to defend himself, to kind of just share how much he cares and loves the Corinthians in, a, in hopes of drawing them back so that he can continue this journey to help them grow deeper with God. And so in 2 Corinthians 6, 3, um, let's go ahead and stand as we read the word. Paul says, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. In other words, his heart is that he doesn't want there to be anything that would just uh, take away from what he is trying to pour into the Corinthians. He doesn't want people to say, you're a hypocrite, you're whatever, you're so messed up, so I'm not going to listen to you. He wants to take away every single barrier so that people can really go deep with God. In 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 5, he says, rather as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Some people have letters of recommendation. When we think of someone who's commendable, it's someone who is praiseworthy, someone who is worthy of honor, and so he's saying, we are living in a way, we are going to, we have lived in a way, we are living in a way such that it's, it's commendable. We're going to commend ourselves as God's servants. How have we commended ourselves? In great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, in distresses. When there's been hardship, people have come against us, people have uh, really, you know, circumstances were so hard, we lived in such a way that people would say, man, they are such great servants of God. In beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. In purity, and understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report. In other words, whether people said we're doing bad stuff or good stuff, whether they're saying, oh, they're so horrible people, they're just in a dishonorable report or, or even in, in a praiseworthy report. Yet, you know, in all of that, living in a way that's above reproach, that's with integrity, that's going to be commendable. They're genuine, yet regarded as imposters. Known, yet regarded as unknown. We're dying, and yet we live on. We're beaten, and yet not killed. We are sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Let's go ahead and have a seat. So in that last part right there, last time when I spoke, we talked about how Jesus gave himself. Jesus poured himself out. Jesus was oppressed. Jesus was slandered. Jesus was maligned. Jesus was disrespected. And yet he brought life. And Paul, last time we were sharing about how just he himself, he carried, him and his companions carried around in himself the, this body of death so that they could experience life. And so again, here we see that Though they are dying, yet they're been, though they've been beaten, yet though they've been genuine, yet though they've been known and given themselves, yet they're regarded as unknown, yet they're beaten, yet they're just all these opposite things, even though their heart has been love, even though out of that love they've been operating out of integrity, even though they've been spending themselves, yet in all these ways they've been disregarded and denied and hurt and maligned. And in all this suffering that Paul has gone through, he says, we have nothing, yet we possess everything. Paul could love so many and suffer so much from so many and not begin to hate them, right? When we, when we get hurt by people, it's, it's easy to start to doubt whether they care about us, right? Uh, it's easy to... To, to then, if they keep hurting us, wonder, do you even really care about me? And then if they keep hurting us, to actually begin to, to hate them and want to hurt them back, right? That's very natural. I think all of us can, can identify with some of these emotions that we've experienced. Paul could love so many and suffer so much from so many and not begin to hate them, not begin to pull back how much he poured out for them, Right? It's easy if we've been hurt to say, okay, well, I'm not going to give that much to that person. 
before we start moving to actually I want to do something against them, right? But Paul always gave so much, gave so much, gave so much. And I want to contrast that with the reaction we often have, right? Our, our reaction is, eh, I think I'm just going to disengage some. Or I'm going to let them know how I feel, right? It's easy to pull back. And yet Paul kept just pouring it on, pouring on the love more and more and more. And I think the natural question would be, why? Because he was being transformed more and more by God's love. So the Christian life is not about trying harder. It's not about doing more. It's not about performing. It's about allowing God to fill us more and more with his spirit and more and more with his love so that we can love. Acts 20.24, Paul says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Testifying not just with words, but with his heart, with his life, with his actions, that in every single way he is testifying of God's grace to him, God's love to him. He's been transformed by that love, and so he's free to give that love away. And Paul then asked the Corinthians, and he asked us to begin to love in that all-out way, too. 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 13, the end of this passage for today. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened, our, uh, opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange... I speak as to my children, open wide your hearts also. That last phrase, as a fair exchange, may make it seem like, okay, well, I'm doing something for you, so you should do something for me. I'm performing, so you should perform. Like a business deal, like in a contract. You treat me well, I'll treat you well. You don't treat me well, I'm going to give you back what you deserve. Right? And so we can think, in 13, Paul is saying, I've given so much to you, I've done so much to you, so you guys got to start performing. But it's not really that aspect of a business relationship. He says in the very next phrase, I speak as to my children. In other words, a parent who would love their kids, I think the hope is in a healthy family that not only do uh, I as a parent pour out my life for my kids, but hopefully at some point my kids, you know, will start to love me and care about me and actually think about what my needs are and care about how I'm doing, right? And if they do, then that relationship can go deeper. It would be weird if at 60, it's always the parents still pouring into the kids and the kids just taking, right? We, it's very natural as we mature and grow that we're going to naturally begin to love in more mature ways. And so he's saying... Paul saying, man, I have loved you guys. I've withheld nothing. I want nothing but the best. And I hope, and I'm asking you to begin to move in that direction also. To love me, to love God, to love others that way also. Not because they're supposed to, not as a rule, not as performance, but because they naturally care and naturally want the best. Hate, in some ways, is the opposite of love, but selfishness is also, in a way, the opposite of love. Because love is about the other person, selfishness is about me. My relationship with Patty could be about me. And I married her not because I cared about her, but because I cared about me. She's cute. I like that. She's very helpful. I like that. It's all about me. She cares for me, so of course I want to be with her. Right? And I could call that love, that's selfishness. Love is, man, I care about her. I care about her heart. I want her to grow. I want her to experience life. And so I'm pouring myself into her. Such that even if she's not helpful to me at some point, even if she gets a little wrinkly, <laughs> uh, it's okay. Right? Half of the uh, marriages in America end in divorce. Why? Because, you know, honey, uh, I'm just not feeling it anymore. 
and you're not feeling it, so we should just call it quits. They didn't go to the altar that way, but after a while, whatever was attractive to them, the humor, the funniness, the, the cuteness, whatever, and it goes away, oh man, you know, it's, it's just so hard right now. We should just call it quits. Because it's really about me. It's not about you. And love is, it's about you. And when it's about you, I'm going to spend myself for you. And all of us in this room are on a journey where we have experienced God's love or are experiencing God's love or experiencing more of God's love. And as that love hits our hearts and hits our minds and hits our thoughts, the hope is, is that it transforms us such that we can then truly love others and love God. God loved Paul and gave all of himself to Paul. 1 John 4, 10 through 12. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, cornerstone, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. And Paul loved God and gave all of himself to God. Mark 12, 30, 31, very familiar to many of us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Second of the great commandment is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So Cornerstone, uh, Elder Duane was talking a little bit about it. Um, our heart, what we feel God has given us as a mission, Pastor Joe talked about it at the beginning of this year, and really it's just kind of this theme that keeps coming up because the heart is for us to go deeper and deeper into what this is. God's call on us, not just as the leadership, but for all of us who have been called to Cornerstone as your home church, the call that God has given us is to join him to join him in reaching and transforming people into passionate followers of Christ. When we are following Christ, when we're following his ways, it's going to, again, lead to a lot of life. It's going to lead to a lot of good in us and through us. But we have to join him on that journey. Unless we are willing to enter into suffering, though, it will be hard to join God right? If God is going one way and his heart is to love people who are hurtful and maybe uh, more than hurtful, <laughs> might actually really do things that are just not easy to love, if we're not willing to suffer, it's going to be hard to join him, right? Because we don't, we don't like not feeling good, right? We don't like suffering. But unless we are willing to enter into suffering, unless the prophets were willing to enter into suffering, unless the disciples were willing to enter into suffering, unless Paul was willing to enter into suffering, it was going to be hard to actually try to help the people. Unless Moses was willing to enter into suffering, it was going to be hard to lead the people from slavery to the promised land. Unless Joseph was willing to enter into suffering, it was going to be hard for him to then be able to provide life when there was a major famine. So unless we are willing to enter into suffering, it's going to be hard to join God in ministering to a world that is hurting and that is broken. Further, unless we are willing to and able to sit with bad emotions in a healthy way, it will be hard to join God. When we are ministering to others, even when we're in life with each other, right, lots of bad emotions can come up, especially in our closest relationships, right? Those we love the most can hurt us the most. And in those times, there can be some really bad emotions that come up. Hurt, pain, feeling marginalized, feeling rejected, feeling angry, right? Feeling sad, feeling depressed. And unless we're able to sit with those emotions, I don't like those emotions. I'm going to actually respond against you because of those emotions. It's going to lead to some ugly breakage. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, um, 
we shouldn't try to deal with those emotions. I'm not saying that we should spiral down with those emotions. But unless we can, in a sense, sit with those emotions, it's going to be hard to minister. Unless Moses was able to sit with those emotions, unless the disciples were able to sit with those, those emotions, unless Paul was able to sit with those emotions, it would be hard to continually stay engaged. So through forgiveness, through really holding these emotions in healthy ways, God's ways, it allows us to actually go deeper with people until God can really connect with their heart and help them move forward. Unless we are filled with more and more of God's love, it will be harder for us to be in suffering. Right? Most of us, when we have suffering, we just want it to end. We just want it to stop. And God sometimes allows it, again, as we talked about last time, because he wants to grow our character. He wants to allow us to understand his heart more. There's a lot of good things that can come through suffering. But unless we're willing to sit in suffering, it's hard to learn those things that God wants to show us and teach us. And I would go further to say that there are some things God wants to teach us that can only be taught through suffering. Can't be taught any other way. Of course, God's God. He could do it anyway. But in a sense, he can't do it any other way. There are things my wife is learning right now through my stubbornness. She is suffering that she is only going to learn through suffering with me. If she tries to end it, she tries to correct my behavior. She just says, I hate these feelings. Get your act together, which not bad. But unless she can sit with the, 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 some of the feelings that come up when in my stubbornness or hurt her, it's going to be hard for her to engage with me in a healthy way such that I can actually take the journey forward. Unless we are filled with more and more of God's spirit, it will be harder to, for us to be in suffering. So unless we're filled with God's love more, and unless we're filled with God's spirit more, it will be hard for us to be in suffering. Not only does God want to teach us certain things and they can only be learned through suffering, God wants to teach us certain things that can only be taught through waiting. Sometimes we don't like to wait, especially in this generation. I want it now. And God says, wait. And in that waiting, God can cultivate something that cannot be cultivated any other way. But sometimes we don't like to wait, so we try to do it our own way. We try to go our own way. We're like, forget you, God. I'm out of here. I'm going to do it this way. And all the while, we're actually shortchanging ourselves. We let Satan use our emotions and leverage our emotions against us. We don't like certain emotions. Satan can use that, drive us down a certain path that's going to lead to death and not to life. God's always trying to lead us on the path of life. But if we don't follow, we're going to be on a path of death. And Satan wants to take us down that path of death. And often, he will leverage our emotions against us bad situation. I don't feel good, God. You don't care. I'm out of here down a path that's going to lead to death. But if we grow in relying on God's spirit, if we grow in loving, it allows us to go on a path of life. So unless we are depending on God more and more, it will be harder for us to be in suffering. If you have thought... that what I'm saying about having this kind of love, uh, if you realize that, man, I can't just try harder to get this love. I can't just try more. I can't just be with my husband more, my wife more, and it's going to lead to that. If you know that your natural response is not going to lead to that, it's going to lead to other things, then I think there's a good realization going on in our heart, and that is that we need God. I think all of us would say, yeah, I need God, but it's when we come face to face with what love is and where we are at, where it's like when we really begin to see that gap in our daily experience, this week, God, I need you. There's something different about that needing God versus this needing God. Yeah, of course I need God versus God, I need you. I cannot love this person. Mike is so hard to love this week. I don't have that kind of patience, God. Help me, God. Do your work in Mike, but do your work in me. When we begin to connect with that need, that's when, on a heart level, we begin to engage with God, 
And that's oftentimes when God starts to begin to move in our hearts to give us that kind of love. If you realize that I don't have that kind of love, I don't have that relationship with the Holy Spirit that I need to be able to love that way, again, that's a good realization. On a heart level, I can't just do this. I can't just read the Bible and think I can do it. Because it's not about following rules or principles or anything. It's about relationship. A relationship of love, a relationship with the Spirit. So again, if we're beginning to realize, I need you, God, to be able to love. I need you, God, to be able to love the world, to be able to move beyond myself. I need you, Holy Spirit. Then that is a good place to be. And that is something that God wants to cultivate in our hearts because that's where life is. Zechariah 4, 6. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Okay, Zerubbabel, very capable craftsman, very gifted craftsman. But God says, I didn't choose the most gifted so he could, out of his own strength, do it, do this work for me. He says, only by my spirit. So again, if we are self-reliant, if we are relying on our own skills, our own talent, our own patience, our own strength, our own ability to cope, our own ability to manage, it's not going to be the path of life. It's just going to be trying harder and doing more. It's what the world's doing. God wants us to be on a better path. So, as we close, some reflection questions. Paul suffered a lot. He was willing to give a lot because he was filled with love. He was in tune with God's spirit. And he shares a lot of his wisdom in the books that we, we like to read. Galatians, Colossians, Corinthian, the different Corinthians. And I, I want to encourage you as you go deeper into your own private time with God, as you read Paul's letters, just see that love, see that heart, and realize it's not about trying to try harder to be like Paul. It's about realizing there's a huge gap between where Paul's at, where we're at, where God's at, and I need your love, God. I need your spirit and cry out to him from that place. So, I'm going to call the music team up here, and we'll kind of go through these reflection questions. Do you find it hard to sacrifice much or suffer much for God or the things that are on his heart? Again, God has certain things. A lot of times our relationship is, God, what can you do for me? God, you're not doing something for me. God, do something for me. But every good friendship is, two ways, right? Not because of barter or exchange or business deal, but it's the natural outflow of love. So how much are we really about the things that are on God's heart? How much do we really care about what's on God's heart? How much are we willing to spend ourselves for what's on God's heart? Do you find it hard to love certain people or to honestly even care about certain people? Right? That's just honest, right? We just naturally don't like certain people, or naturally don't think about certain people, don't care about certain people. Do you find it hard to sit with negative emotions in a healthy way? Do you find it hard to forgive? Do you feel you want to love others, even those who are hard to love, but just don't have much capacity or strength to love them very much? So if in today, seeing Paul, if in measuring our own lives, we realize, man, honestly, there's a gap. Before I, I share this message, God deals with me. I see the gap. Do you see the gap? If you see the gap, then in this response time, tell God you can't. I can't. I can't love that way. I don't love that way. Part of me doesn't want to love that way, but part of me does. So help me, God, to love that way. And ask him to give you that love and reliance on the Holy Spirit to move you forward.